Uh, I just want to welcome everyone to uh, Hope Church this morning. I'm going to pull up uh, our little announcement slides here. And uh, there'll be a link for the worship guide there in the chat. The worship guide is uh, basically just a place where you can get some announcements for this week, get all the links and things that you need. Uh, there's a few things happening uh, just for you to be aware of. So all that is kind of listed there in the worship guide. Uh, and also, if you're uh, new with us, maybe you're joining here on Zoom this morning, your first time. Uh, being one of our guests, um, or maybe you're watching this on YouTube or Facebook later, and um, uh, you haven't, uh, you know, gotten connected with us or gotten to know us. Uh, this is just a really great place to do that. Is through our Connect card. Uh, there's an online uh, uh, version of it. There's a link there in the worship guide. Just really lets us get connected with you. You can ask questions, and we just uh, answer those for you, but also send you whatever information that you'd like about our church. So um, just wanted to kind of point you to that as well. Well, um, as we uh, get going this morning, um, we are continuing our sermon series, We Believe. And as has been um, my, I don't want to say tradition, but my normal is longer sermons because there's so much to say. So I'm going to try to keep it keep the service to a minimum today. So we want to do our best. So to do that, let's go ahead and just keep going and uh, hopefully uh, be able to get through uh, and get everything covered that we need to today. Uh, but first, um, uh, Nicomas, why don't you start us off with a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll just continue on with our service. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this day. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Um, thank you for uh, just this local body gathering together. Um, as we open up your word, I pray that you uh, teach us more about who you are, um, teach us more about um, what you've created, um, what your plan is um, for each and every one of us. Um, and just, um, yeah, just... I uh, pray that as we as we learn about you, that we love you more um, and that we worship you um, in spirit and in truth. Uh, we thank you and we love you. And it's in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nicomas. Appreciate that. Well, Seasung is uh, taking the morning off from leading in worship. And so uh, today we're going to still see Seasung, but it's going to be a recorded version of him. So go ahead and uh, mute yourself, and I'll mute myself as well. And uh, we're going to just sing, sing along uh, with Seasung uh, here right now. We will rise 
from Ephesians 6, 10 to 12. Finally, be strengthened by the Lord and by his vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against the evil spiritual forces in the heavens. Um, Hebrews 1, 13 to 14. Um, now, to which of the angel has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation? Thank you, Joy, for reading that for us. So, as you can tell today, we are jumping into the topic of angels and demons. And, uh, you know, this can be, you know, you can look at it one of two ways. You can be kind of weirded out a little bit that we're studying this. You know, it's kind of a, uh, it's a, it's a fascinating topic, but it's also can be a little bit different from what uh, we were kind of used to in our lives, so to speak. Um, 
or we could be quite excited because uh, we are going to look at some things that uh, may be new for you that uh, maybe you have not uh, even believed in their existence or maybe you just haven't really understood uh, who they are and what they do. And so I hope something today uh, just helps you understand a little bit more. But um, I do know one thing as uh, you know, the weather is getting nicer. We're what, like, you know, plus 15 today or something, I think it's going to be. And so I hope everyone will be outside at some point. Uh, you know, uh, vaccines are rolling out a little bit more and things are just looking a little bit better for us. You know, there, there's a, like, you know, that, that light at the end of the tunnel, that little ray of hope is getting a little bit bigger that all this COVID stuff is going to be over. But, you know, I'm ready for it to be over so that we can get back to uh, Marvel making three awesome movies every year. All right. So I always watch the Marvel movies. Movies. Whenever they came out, I enjoyed them. Several of them I watched multiple times, um, and so I'm ready for you know uh, for to to make awesome Marvel movies again. Yes, I'm gonna put that on a red hat. Anyways, um, I I'm just ready for that to happen. But you know. Marvel movies are all about, you know, aliens and they're about these kind of supernatural beings or, you know, people who somehow get superpowers or they're aliens from other places who come and try to attack Earth with their cosmic powers and it's quite uh, um, uh, fanciful, right? It's, it's uh, built in the world of fantasy and not in reality. Um, did you know that of the top 10 highest grossing movies of all time, that only four are not about supernatural beings or aliens. Only four. All right? And of those four, one is about talking lions, the Lion King, and the other is about dinosaurs living now. All right? So really, only two of the top 10, uh, top 10 highest grossing movies of all time could actually happen. But it does highlight something. We are fascinated with the supernatural. Uh, the, the highest grossing movies uh, all attest to that. Uh, even if we don't believe in it, we are at least interested or fascinated or, you know, like to even read and study about what people say and actually do believe about them. And so it's safe to say that our society is quite fascinated through the supernatural, though most believe it only exists in movies or it only exists in books or in the land of fantasy, not in our reality. And today here in our city and in our country and this society we live in, if you say you believe in supernatural beings, there's a good chance that you'll get a weird stare or they'll just laugh at you. Uh, it is not the most, um, you know, you, if you're meeting someone for the first time, it's probably not how you're going to start the conversation. Like, hi, I'm Dustin. I believe in supernatural beings. Like, hi, I'm Bill. See you later. You know, it's, it's, it's not the way you usually start off most conversations. And the, the reality is, like, a lot of people, uh, especially if they have no uh, religious beliefs, uh, really just kind of see it as silly uh, to believe in something like the supernatural. Uh, why is that? Well, I think here in our Western society, we are taught that the supernatural doesn't need to exist because science can explain the unexplainable. But if you're somewhere other than, if, if you're from somewhere other than North America, or you've spent time uh, living or traveling abroad, uh, you were probably exposed and even maybe raised to believe more in the supernatural. Um, it's very much a kind of a North American uh, cultural uh, concept that there is no supernatural, no need for. But in many other cultures and countries around the world, it is actually quite normal. So today we're going to look uh, and we're going to continue our sermon series uh, called We Believe, uh, looking at the key doctrines or beliefs that we believe as Christians. And today we're going to look at the really intriguing topic of supernatural beings. So here's going to be our first, uh, our, our We Believe statement for today. So we believe in the existence of spiritual beings, angels who are God's agents, and demons who are God's adversaries. So I'm going to go ahead and say it right off of the beginning. Yes, I do believe in their existence, and I'm going to show you some reasons why. So today, what we're going to look at in relation to uh, 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 angels and demons, essentially, is we're going to look at how they came to exist, what they are like, what they do, and how we should view and interact with them. Okay, what is our response to them, so to speak? So I want to take, uh, take that sentence down. I'm going to break it down into three parts. So let's first just look at what we believe in their existence. And so... Really what we're talking about when we talk about spiritual beings, we're, we're really talking about angels and demons. And there's some common things about their existence and their origin and their nature uh, that we can kind of uh, study together. So we're going to kind of lump them together for right now. The first thing to note is that they are created beings. 
Okay, uh, They have not always existed. They are not eternal beings like God. And as we discussed when we discussed the Trinity, only the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Spirit, is, uh, has no beginning and no end. Uh, spiritual beings, angels and demons, did have a beginning. They were created beings. Nehemiah 9.6 uh, helps us understand this. It says, You, Lord, are the only God. You created the heavens, the highest heavens with all their stars, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them, and all the stars of heaven worship you. So this word stars here is more often translated as army or host, and is really used with angelic beings in the Old Testament uh, quite often. So we believe here that he is actually talking, that when he says stars, he's actually talking about angels. Other translations use the word hosts. So since angels are created beings and we only see God doing the act of creating in Genesis 1, it's safe to assume that the uh, uh, spiritual beings, angels, were created sometime before the end of day 6 in Genesis 1. Genesis 1 doesn't highlight that. He talks about the sun, moon, and stars being created. It talks about land and, and birds and fish and animals and people, but it doesn't specifically say uh, in Genesis 1 about the creation of angelic beings. But as we see here in Nehemiah, a few other passages talk about how they were part of God's creation, they even sang as He was created. The first, thing, the first job they had after they were created was to sing praises to God while He was still creating. So, if they were all created in Genesis 1, before the end of day 6, then at some point in time, all angels were good. At some point in time, there were no demons. There was no Satan. It was all good angels at some point. But that changed as we're going to look at in a few minutes. And so since they are created beings, they have limitations. They have uh, limitations as just uh, like, what, uh, like we have uh, as created beings. Uh, spiritual beings are not all-knowing, though they are highly intelligent. They are not omnipresent or everywhere present. They can only be in one place at one time, much like us. And they are not all-powerful. Since we believe that only God is all-powerful, and as we'll discuss in a few minutes, Satan, the fallen angel, was actually defeated and will be even more defeated. And so if you can be defeated, you're not all-powerful. So they are created beings. The second thing they are is they are supernatural beings. The Bible calls them spirits often. Uh, refers to them as spirits. And so they are actually invisible to us. We don't uh, often see them. So... Though they are spirits and though they are invisible, there are many instances in the Bible where they do actually manifest themselves and appear to people. And they are actually do become visible. But in their actual nature, what makes them who they are, they are spiritual or invisible beings. They weren't created with physical bodies like we were. We were created physically with a spiritual nature. But they were created as spirits who can sometimes take on the physical appearance uh, or maybe even inhabit a physical body. Uh, we see in the Bible, snake in Genesis 3, uh, pigs with uh, Jesus interacting with uh, a group of demons and he put them into pigs. And then we also see them kind of taking control over humans as well. And so we see that they can actually uh, uh, inhabit um, some physical body, but in their nature, they don't have a physical body. So they are created beings, they are supernatural, and they have will or the freedom to make choices. We really see this highlighted in 2 Peter 2.4. It says, For if God didn't spare the angels who sinned, but cast them into hell and deliver them in chains of utter darkness to be kept for judgment. So it says there that who sinned. As we talked uh, last week, when we talked about the fall, uh, sin is a choice. It's something that we choose to do. And because Adam and Eve had the uh, free will to make the choice to sin against God, that is what gave them the capacity to do that. And so just in a very similar way as humans have free will, so do spiritual beings. Now, as we'll discuss in a few minutes, Satan, who was originally a good angel, he chose to rebel against God. And in doing so, it says that one-third of the angels followed him and rebelled as well. That's mentioned later in Revelation chapter 12. And so uh, here is Satan. He chooses to rebel against God. He enacts his free will to do that. And with him, about a third of the angels also make that decision as well. But here's what the Bible doesn't really make clear for us. And we don't, really, we don't, we don't need to speculate too much or try to think too much about it. Just something that the Bible really doesn't clarify for us is if good angels can now make the choice to rebel against God and join the demons, 
I doubt that would happen because they can actually see firsthand what living like a demon is like in that future, and I don't think they want it. So it's a pretty good deterrent. And the Bible also doesn't say anywhere that fallen angels or demons or even Satan himself have the opportunity to repent and ask God's forgiveness as we do. And I don't believe they had that opportunity. I do believe they had a free will, but now I believe that uh, because they are different from humans, that uh, they do not get the opportunity of salvation as we do. And um, so th that kind of separates us from uh, spiritual beings in a sense is that, uh, you know, there's another passage in the Bible that, that says that uh, angels long to look at, uh, uh, into the lives of humans as they see God saving them is curious to them. And so we don't believe that they can be redeemed. Good angels don't need it. Um, bad angels can do, but they don't get it. So... Now that we talked about spiritual beings, that uh, they are created, they are supernatural, and they have will or their freedom to choose, I want us to look specifically at angels. So we believe that angels are God's agents. And the way that they, uh, an agent is someone who acts on the behalf of another, carries out a task for uh, someone. And so angels are, in the Bible, we kind of see kind of four main key categories uh, of angels. We said that they are messengers, they are ministers, they are warriors, and they are worshipers. Okay, so that's kind of the four things that we see, the four roles that we see angels taking on in the Bible. And so, now we need to ask a question, well, okay, who are angels specifically, and what do they do? Because we talked about spiritual beings, and angels are spiritual beings. They're the, the good side, okay? And so, first let's look at all these four uh, in turn. Angels are God's messengers who communicate God's plan or desires to people. So we see this throughout the, the Bible in many places that uh, angels are messengers. They, they bring a, like a note from God to people. Uh, Gabriel, who is actually one of only two named angels in the Bible, only two angels actually given a name in the Bible. And the first one is Gabriel. And here we see in the Old Testament, he actually comes to uh, Daniel in the Old Testament and brings him uh, some revelations and visions in the chapters uh, in Daniel chapter 8, 9, and 10. He has his pretty long extensive conversation. He actually comes back for a second visit to Daniel and he brings a message about what is going to happen in the future to Daniel. Uh, Gabriel also is the one who appeared to Zechariah and to Mary in Luke 1 to announce the births of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. And so there Gabriel is mentioned. But there are also other unnamed angels in the Bible who do appear to people, bring a message of some sort, and then they go away, but they're not named. So is it Gabriel the whole time? Could be, but often they actually come in pairs. There's more than one. And so we would believe that Gabriel isn't the only messenger angel, but that there are actually more who um, uh, can bring a message to people. Gabriel just happens to be the one that is named. So, angels also are God's ministers sent to encourage us sometimes. Okay? So, I put the word sometimes in there because we'll explain that in a minute. But there's a very, very interesting verse, and Joy just read this for us in Hebrews 1 13 through 14. It says, Now to which of the angels. Has he, speaking of God, ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? In Hebrews chapter 1, the author is really uh, showing through Old Testament scripture how Jesus Christ is superior to everything else. And in this section, he's superior to all angels. And so he's saying, you know, To which of the angels has God ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies my footstool? Well, he didn't say that to any Sorry, angels. He only said that, Hey, Siri, I don't need you. Siri. Sorry, Siri picked up something. What, what did I say? Sit. Uh, southern accent came in and Siri translated sit as Siri. Anyways. Um, so God never said this to any angel. He only said it to Jesus Christ. But here's what it does say about them in verse 14, the very next verse. Are they, speaking of angels, not all ministering spirits sent out to serve those who are going to inherit salvation? They are in some way ministers to us. Now, after Jesus was tempted by Satan in Matthew 4, angels came and ministered to him, it says there in Matthew 4, probably bringing him food and water and encouragement. When the prophet Elijah was running for his life and in despair, an angel brought him food and water in 1 Kings 19. So we don't know exactly what it looks like for angels to serve us now, but given what the Bible says about them, we can say at least that they serve us in at least three ways. 
First is rejoicing when we repent of our sin and trust in Jesus to save us. Here in Luke 15, 10, this is Jesus saying, uh, Jesus speaking. He says, I tell you in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. So in a way, they're ministering to us as they rejoice in our salvation. They are cheering us on as we come to faith. And then they also protect us. This is another way that they minister to us. It says, For he, speaking of God, will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you in all your ways. And so there's a, uh, one way they may serve us is in protecting us in ways we actually don't even get to see. And there's a third way that they often um, uh, minister to us. This comes in Hebrews chapter 13, which is, this, this verse is, is an interesting one to study. And there's a couple of different interpretations. Um, but for today, let's look at it uh, believing that it's talking about actual angels. Hebrews 13, 2 says, Don't neglect to show hospitality, for by doing this, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. Now, some people believe that this is not talking about spiritual beings as angels, because angels can also mean the word messenger. So maybe it's just, uh, you know, uh, messengers that uh, carry letters. Maybe it could be, or maybe it's, you know, uh, Christian leaders from other churches who come to their city and they're being hospitable to them. They don't really know that they are actually coming to encourage them. I tend to believe this actually is talking about angels, but um, it says here that we may actually be welcoming an angel unaware. Uh, we don't even know about it. So maybe they give us opportunities to demonstrate care and compassion to a stranger. Um, don't speculate too much. Don't, you know, every time that you help someone who is a stranger, don't say, oh, I definitely helped an angel today. It may not be that. It could just be a human who just needs some help at that moment. But I think this verse does allow for the opportunity for uh, angels to actually appear as people who, who are in need in order for us to be able to show them hospitality. So the other thing that angels are, is they are God's warriors. And we looked at how they are his messengers and they are God's ministers. But they are also his warriors, and they fight against Satan and his spiritual forces. So the other named angel in the Bible is Michael, often called the archangel. Uh, he's described as the, like, the lead warrior angel, almost like he's the general of God's angelic army. He's the leader. And in, the, in, in, in all the stories of the Bible that really relate to Michael, you see him fighting somebody, all right? Um, he, he, he's really into MMA. He's always in the octagon, all right? He's either fighting a demon like the Prince of Persia in Daniel chapter 10. Fascinating story. You really need to read Daniel chapter 10. It'll blow your mind. Um, but he actually wrestles a demon who is the Prince of Persia. And so we actually see there is ranking among their armies. There's a Prince of Persia who probably has little minion demons under him. And here is Michael fighting against him. Um, or we see in, if you fast forward to Revelation, Revelation chapter 12, we see that Michael is fighting against the devil himself and against the angel. He's kind of leading the charge in the final battle. Um, and then he's also called the great prince who stands watch over Israel, kind of in a protective guard mode. And that's mentioned in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And so here we see that angels are not always the cute little fluffy, uh, you know, cute cheeked little things that we like to draw in kids' books. Um, they're warriors, they can handle themselves, they're quite powerful. Uh, in 2 Kings 19, God's uh, angels actually destroy uh, the Assyrian army of over 180,000 people. Uh, they just destroy them. Uh, not someone you want to mess with, okay? So they are warriors. But the other thing they are is they are worshipers. They are worshipers who praise God. Hebrews 1, 5 through 6 says, For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son? Today I have become your father, or again I will be his father, separating the angels from, from Jesus Christ. Again, when he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Angels exist to worship Jesus. If you read in Isaiah chapter 6, you see a different category of angel called the seraphim. And their job is just to be around God's throne, continuous, continuously worshiping him day and night. They do nothing else but worship. And so even within angels, there's different types of angels. There's seraphim and cherubim, and they, they do different things. And so we see that one of their main roles is to worship God just like our, one of our main roles is to worship God. Now, before we uh, move on to the conversation of uh, demons, which I kind of want to avoid, but we got to get to it anyways, uh, here are some common questions about angels that I've heard or have been asked and have even wondered myself. So I just want to kind of answer three common questions quickly. You probably will have more, and hopefully after the sermon, you probably have some more. And Feel free to, to email those in or bring them up in community group this week. Um, so here's a couple questions. Maybe this would be kind of fun for you. Here's the first one. Does each person have a guardian angel who is assigned to them? Now, 
You may have been uh, brought up and told by someone that uh, you've got a guardian angel who is protecting you. So where does that come from in the Bible? It actually comes from three different passages that when you look at them could actually uh, uh, be talking about a personal guardian angel or they may not. So to answer this question, I'll say maybe. We don't exactly know, but it, I think it is actually possible. So if you study Psalm 91, 11 through 12, Matthew 18, 10, and Acts 12, 15, they don't have to mean each person has their own personal angel. But the Bible is clear that angels do guard and look after Christians. It is not clear that we are actually assigned one who only looks after us. Okay, But is it possible? I think it is. If you read those passages, Psalm 91, Matthew 18, 10, and Acts 12, 15, it kind of seems like there are some personal angels involved there. Uh, later this week, I always send out my sermon notes into email, and I've got a couple of footnotes uh, on the document that relate to this specifically if you want to dig into it a little bit further. So, uh, does each person have a guard angel who was assigned, to, assigned just to them? Maybe. All right, we have to kind of leave it there because that's where the Bible kind of leaves it. Second fun question, do we become angels when we die? No. This is an easy one to answer. No, we do not. People stay people. Angels stay angels. The idea that people become angels whenever we die actually comes from a document written a lot later after the Bible called Acts of Paul and Thecla. All right? And that's where actually it says that uh, when they die, people become angels. It's not a biblical source, and it doesn't. there is actually no reliable evidence that uh, this unique book, the Acts of Paul and Thecla, represent what the wider church actually believed at that time. And so, do we become angels when we die? No. People stay people. Angels stay angels. That is actually quite clear in the Bible. And the third question. Do angels have wings? I'm like, of course they do. Every picture I've ever seen of angels, they always have wings. Uh, be careful. There are actually only two types of angels in the Bible described as having wings. There are the cherubim and the seraphim. The cherubim we actually see in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, whenever God kicks out Adam and Eve, he puts a, a, a guardian cherub with a flaming sword. All right? And then later, in the book of Exodus, when Moses is in charge of creating the Ark of the Covenant, the designers uh, make the Ark of the Covenant, which signified God's presence, kind of like this big box. It was covered in gold, and two angels with their wing tips touching each other, coming across, uh, 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 kind of sit on top of this uh, Ark of the Covenant, of this box. And so the cherubim have wings. And then in Isaiah 6, they are described as creatures that have wings as well, and they are constantly around the throne of God, worshiping Him. But the question then is, well, are all angels seraphim or cherubim? We don't exactly know. So I would say, do angels have wings? We know that some do. But whenever you look at the stories of, uh, in the Bible when angels do appear to people, they actually don't appear with wings. There's not a description of one that appears to someone and it says that they have wings. But it does say things like they shine like a bright light, they have eyes like lightning, really cool clothes covered in really cool gemstones, booming voices that sound like a multitude, and people are always afraid of them. And it doesn't actually say that they have wings when they appear. If you think practically, angels don't really need wings because wings are needed for lift off in air. If you're a spiritual being, you don't really have the constraints of air. All right, you don't have limitations like air and gravity to deal with. You're a spiritual being. You just zip, you go wherever you need to. But I think it's fine to have angels with wings in kids' Bibles, books, and in Christian art. It doesn't really bother me. Just wanted to have fun with this answering this question. So if you have a picture of an angel with wings on your wall, you can keep it. It's fine. All right, so. Now we got to get to the not as fun one, but it could be interesting for some. We also believe that demons are God's adversaries. So, Dustin, you believe in the existence of demons? Yes. Do you believe that uh, Satan exists? Yes. Does Satan have a tail and a pitchfork? No. All right, so answer another common question there. But we believe that demons are God's adversaries. They oppose who God is and all he does, and they oppose us, God's people. They are our adversaries. They are not on our side. Joy read for us Ephesians chapter 6. It says, Finally be strengthened by the Lord by His vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. This is all talking about demons. All right. So, what Paul is alluding to here. This struggle that we have that's not against flesh and blood, not against other humans, it's against spiritual things. We call it spiritual warfare, and it's a daily battle that we have. 
We daily fight the temptation to sin. We daily fight feeling like God has left us or let us down. We daily fight fears and insecurities that do nothing but tear us down. We daily fight maintaining a godly lifestyle so our witness for Christ is not hindered. And we daily fight physical and mental ailments that cause us to doubt if God actually cares. Are all these spiritual war- warfare? In some ways, they most likely are. Does it mean that every time you're sick, it's a demon attacking you? Not necessarily. All right. Every time we sin, is it the devil made me do it? Not necessarily. You have a sinful nature that actually doesn't need a lot of influence from the from Satan to help you do it, okay? But sometimes I do think there are times when Satan or demons are actually influencing and trying to lead us into temptation. So, who are demons and what do they do? They are angels who rebelled against God at some point before Genesis 3 happened and were cast away from God's presence. So we talked earlier that they were created good. So at Genesis 1, at the end, everything, is, everything was good. All of God's creation was good. Therefore, all angels were good. But at some point before Genesis 3 happened, we don't know if that was days, weeks, months, or years. The Bible doesn't say. But at some point before Genesis 1 and the, the conclusion of creation, Genesis 1 and 2, and when in Genesis 3 where a snake starts talking to Eve, somewhere in that time period, Satan decided that he needed to be God. He made a choice, and in that choice, he actually rebelled against God. And we're going to read the passages about that in just a minute. And he was cast away from God's presence. And many demons, at least a third, followed behind him. So Satan, whose name actually means adversary, that's why we say that they are adversaries, he is the head of all demons, and he led the rebellion against God that we're going to read about in just a minute. He is also called Lucifer, the deceiver, the devil, the serpent, the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the father of lies, and a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't have a lot of good titles going for him. All right, He wears many hats, but none of them are good. Here is some uh, two very, uh, really important passages for us to understand uh, just uh, how demons came to be, how Satan came to be. This comes from two passages, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. I want to read these. We can't take the time to go into them in depth. I want to read them because they're actually very important for us to kind of understand the theology of understanding Satan and demons. So, it says, Shiny morning star. This is in reference to Lucifer, to Satan. How you have fallen from the heavens. You destroyer of nations. You have been cut down to the ground. You said to yourself, I will ascend to the heavens. I will set up my throne above the stars of God. The stars there, probably meaning angels. I will sit on the mount of God's assembly in the remotest parts of the north. I will ascend above the highest clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Does that sound familiar? Genesis 3, how did Satan tempt Eve? No, no, no. If you eat, God knows that you will be like him. See, Satan actually tricked Adam and Eve with the same exact lie he himself believed. But you will be brought down to Sheol, into the deepest uh, regions of the pit. Son of man, lament. Oh, it's, okay, sorry. So that's, that's Isaiah. Now we're going to move to Ezekiel 28. Son of man, lament for the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the Lord God says. You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now this is something you say, well, it's talking about the, uh, the king of Tyre. Who is that? Is Satan the king of Tyre? In Old Testament prophecy literature, often the prophet would be talking about two things at the same time. So he's talking to the physical, literal king of Tyre, and he's actually talking to and about Satan at the same time. And he's actually uh, correlating them. He's, he's kind of given this prophecy. That's how prophetic literature is written. So we can understand, as based, on, based on some things that it says, that this actually is speaking of Satan. But he's actually comparing it and relating it to this king of Tyre. So you were the seal of perfection. All right, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. So this is why Satan doesn't have a pitchfork and a nasty little face and horns and all this kind of stuff and a tail. He's actually quite a beautiful uh, angelic being. You were in Eden, the garden of God. This is how we know it's not the king of Tyre. It's talking about someone else. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every kind of precious stone covered you. Uh, Cornelian, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, and emerald. In gold, they were prepared on the day you were created. You were an anointed guardian cherub. So at least he has wings. For I had appointed you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked among the fiery stones. Another description of angels. From the day you were created, you were blameless in your ways until wickedness was found in you. He was created good and then wickedness was found in him. 
Through the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I expelled you in disgrace from the mountain of God, from among my fiery stones. Your heart became proud because of your beauty. For the sake of your splendor, you corrupted your wisdom. So I threw you down to the ground. I made you a spectacle before kings. You profaned your sanctuaries by the magnitude of your iniquities and your dishonest trade. So I made it, I made fire come from within you, and it consumed you. I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of everyone watching you. All those who know you among the peoples are appalled at you, have become an object of horror, and will never exist again. So, quite harsh words. But did you notice here that Satan's sin was actually pride? He wanted to be God. He wanted to ascend higher than God. He wanted to be in the place of God. He didn't want to accept his role as a guardian cherub. He was most likely the head angel. Most likely he was the number one angel, God's best and most beautiful angel in charge of Garden of Eden, in charge of where human existence came to be. We don't know all the story behind what happened, but he chose to sin. His pride led him to sin. So we see that Satan was the originator of sin and was the original or first sinner. So we talk about, well, how did sin come into the world? What is the origin of it? Well, Satan is the origin of it. I don't believe that God created evil. I believe that Satan brought evil. All right? He is the originator of sin and he was the original sinner. So sin, pain, suffering, and evil come from Satan, while freedom, relief, forgiveness, and healing come from God. And just like demons, they're kind of in the same boat. Here, Jude 1.6 says, And the angels who did not keep their own position but abandoned their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains and deep darkness for the judgment on the great day. This is referring to demons, these angels who did not keep their position. They had the same type of pride that Satan had as well. They did not like their assignment and the role given by God, so they followed Satan's footsteps and rebelled against God. And the result was that they were cast out of heaven, away from God's presence. Revelation 12.4 says that one-third of the angels were fallen and went with him. So, what does Satan and his demons do now? Good question for us. So, they, they, we just looked at kind of their history and their background in the Bible, but what do they do now? Well, I think there's kind of three main things, and there could be more. But I think, first of all, as we see in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, that they blind people from seeing their need for the gospel. I think they just, in some way, now how, how, do they, how do they influence us and tempt us and all that? I, I don't exactly know those things. Um, but in some way, they do actually blind. They, they keep people from seeing their need for Jesus Christ. And they uh, help them uh, uh, stay stuck in their sinful state. So I think they blind people from seeing their need from the gospel. I think they also tempt people or attempt, attempt to tempt I should probably change that. They try to tempt people into committing sin. Matthew 4, 1 through 11 is the story of Jesus being tempted. Satan spends that whole time trying to get Jesus to sin, and he says no. Genesis 3, Satan was successful in tempting Eve and Adam with the same thing that he desired to be like God. So one of the things that Satan and demons do is they try to tempt people into sinning. And they also use whatever tactic, whether it's temptation, doubt, lying, fear, confusion, envy, pride, slander, you name it to destroy a Christian's reputation and hinder their effectiveness for God. So, can demons possess a Christian? No, I don't believe so. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit and a demon can live in the same house. Right? I don't think that's possible. But they have some way of influencing us. Even as Christians, they still have some way of influencing us. That's why Paul said in Ephesians 6 that we have to put on the armor of God as Christians to fight against the schemes, the tricks of the devil. We also see in 1 Peter 5.8, Peter says, be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. He wants to devour us. He doesn't want to help us. He wants to devour us because if he can devour us, God's children, that's the best way that he can get back at God. So, but Satan and his demons do not always get what they want. The very next verse says this, resist him. It's possible to resist him. In the firm in the faith, knowing that the same kind of sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. But Peter says, whenever Satan is roaming around like a lion trying to devour someone, he comes to you, you can resist him. And also Ephesians 4.27 uh, 4, says, Don't even give the devil an opportunity to keep you angry at someone. In many ways, we don't have to succumb to the devil's tricks and temptation. We actually can resist him. So, Satan was the originator of sin. But 
I want to show you something else. Satan has been defeated already, and he will one day be completely defeated. Jesus' resurrection from the dead defeated Satan, because Satan's, uh, Satan brought death to humanity. But Jesus' resurrection proved that death could be defeated. And if Jesus conquered death, then he can give us life. So now Jesus is the master of death, no longer Satan, all because of the resurrection. And also, as we read the book of Revelation, which is another kind of fun and confusing book, Jesus' second coming will forever defeat Satan. We see this in Revelation 12, starting at verse 7. This is another kind of apocalyptic future uh, prophetic literature. It says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael, our you know, lead warrior uh, uh, MMA fighter here, and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels also fought. The dragon here is another description for Satan. But he could not prevail, speaking of the dragon, and there was no place for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was thrown out, the ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the one who deceives the whole world. He was thrown to earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, The salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have now come. Sisters, what happened there? Oh, I think it, uh, some words got left out. Who accuses them before our God day and night has been thrown down. They conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they did not love their lives to the point of death. Therefore rejoice you heavens and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you with great fury. This is talking about later. It's not talking about right now. It's talking about something that's going to happen in the future. But the reality is he was cast down and he will be defeated. That's kind of the level one defeat. But then he's finally defeated, we see in Revelation 20. When a thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. And he will go out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. They came up across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the encampment of the saints, the beloved city. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed them. The devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Listen, Satan knows his future. He knows that he will be completely defeated. There will come a day that our existence as God's people will be free from any kind of satanic or demonic influence, free from temptation to sin, free from suffering. There will be a day, and that is our hope for when heaven comes to earth in the future. So Satan knows his time is limited, so he's going to do all he can to devour, harm, and keep people from God. But ultimately, he's a defeated little puppy. So, as you wrap up, Believing in spiritual beings like angels and demons is not the most popular view in our society because so many of you belief in the supernatural is silly and only belongs in the realm of mythology. It's like, you know, leave the supernatural for Marvel movies and aliens and all that kind of thing. Like, they, like don't bring Marvel movie type fantasy into real life. But if we say we believe the Bible, all of it, then we as Christians have to believe in the existence of supernatural spiritual beings because the Bible actually talks about them a lot. Spiritual beings, angels and demons, are discussed in both the Old and New Testaments. Angels are mentioned over 300 times in the Bible, and demons more than 80 times. They are mentioned from, all the way from Genesis 3 all the way through Revelation 20. So almost every section of the Bible has some type of conversation about angels or demons. Jesus believed in their existence. He had conversations with them and even taught about them. The apostles Paul, Peter, and John all talked about them in their letters as if they were real. We've already actually referenced several of those already. And two of Jesus' own half-brothers, James and Jude, who at one time did not believe in the supernatural ability of their own brother Jesus, wrote about demons in their own letters in the Bible. So, here we see that all these skeptics at first, uh, Jesus' brothers, all these different characters in the Bible from Old and New Testament, they all talked about angels and demons. They all talk about the reality of spiritual beings. So I would say that we are in good company if we say we also believe in the existence of spiritual beings such as angels and demons. So as we wrap up, how do we apply this? You know, how do we have a sermon about angels and demons and like what, what is the application that you can take away uh, today? Well, here, here are a few things uh, to encourage you as we close. I would say this, we can and should believe in the existence of the supernatural. I don't think you're silly for believing it. I think you're biblical. 
Okay. If you struggle with believing that, well, that's okay. We can keep talking. Let's just look at the Bible and see what it has to say. But I think we can and we should believe in the existence of the supernatural. I think God is supernatural, and there is such thing as spiritual activity and spiritual warfare that we need to be aware of. Secondly, we need to be aware of supernatural activity around us. Angels as our guardians. We don't need to be always looking out for it and say, you know, every time, oh, I almost got into a car wreck, but my angel protected me. Maybe or maybe you just swerved out of the way. It can go either way, okay? We don't need to be always looking at them. And, we, and the Bible is very clear. We aren't to worship them. We aren't to pray to them. And we shouldn't, you know, seek them, okay? But we just simply need to be aware that God is using them to minister to us. That they rejoice when we become uh, a Christian. That they in some way are ministering to us. And if God wants to bring us a message through an angel, I think He can still do it if He wants to. Though we haven't heard of that happening quite often lately. We also need to be aware of supernatural activity of demons around us as our enemy. As Ephesians 6 says, it's very clear that our battle is a spiritual battle. And we need to be ready. So... This is kind of interesting. Uh, Friday, uh, Craig, uh, one of our church members, called me and he knew I was preaching on this. He just wanted to pray for me because he you know, assumed, and he rightly assumed, that studying about angels um, um, but more about demons and Satan is not the most fun thing to study and write a sermon about. And he's very true. And last night, I, you know, I finished up my sermon last night, got all my notes you know, put together and everything, and I went to bed at a really good time. I um, uh, went to bed uh, actually a little bit early. And I am normally a great sleeper. I am normally a fantastic sleeper. Uh, I, I lay my head down. You can ask my wife. I fall asleep quickly and I stay asleep for the whole night. It takes a lot to wake me up uh, when I'm asleep. But last night, for some reason, I was up wide awake at 3 a.m. And I was awake for hours. I lay there, could not go back to sleep. And then finally, a little after 5 a.m., at some point after that time, I fell back asleep. Only to keep waking up for the next hour or two that I kept trying to sleep. And that's kind of rare for me. So was that some type of spiritual attack on me? Could be. It's very probable. It could be something else. I mean, I wasn't feeling physically bad or anything, but it very well could be. I only bring that up to say, was Dustin attacked by demons last night? I don't think I was really attacked. Uh, but is there spiritual warfare happening all around me? Yes. Could my sleep have been affected by it last night because of some type of demonic influence? I think it's very, very probable and actually most likely but we don't need to be afraid we need to be aware of it and here's what i would say to kind of flow from that we should not have an unhealthy fear of demons all right when i was an 11 year old boy 11 years old i had this random fear that i was going to be possessed by a demon i really did i was talking to my dad about it and i was just scared to death that that was going to happen i don't know why but as an 11 year old boy i was waking up in the night having this fear but you know, that fear actually led me to come to Christ. It actually led to my salvation. So don't be afraid. A demon cannot possess or indwell a Christian because the Holy Spirit cannot dwell in the same house with a demon. So you don't have to fear that. You don't have to fear that all their activity around is going to just completely ruin you because guess what? The angels, as we've seen, are actually fighting against them at the same time. And so we've got a pretty good team on our back. At least two-thirds versus one-third. The numbers are in our favor. We should not have a healthy, an unhealthy obsession with angels. You probably have met someone who just kind of seems to worship angels more than they worship God. All right. So don't go about life hoping your guardian angel protects you from every bad thing that could happen to you. you know, don't start talking to your guardian angel or praying to them. All right. Ask God to protect you, and maybe He'll use an angel to do that. And lastly, we should be aware. We should beware of false teaching about angels and demons that does not come from the Bible. I think demons can and do influence people to speak non-truth about God. That is part of their deception. So I would say, if you do hear something related to angels and demons, test it with what the Bible says. You know, Jesus confronted demonic forces quite often in His ministry. There are seven unique instances or even miracles in the four Gospels where Jesus uh, actually cast out demons from people. And if you read them, you'll notice a common trend. The demons... The, uh, through the person they are possessing, they, they actually confessed that Jesus was truly the Son of God and had all power over them. They, they knew who they were dealing with. There was not a single demon who was an atheist. They believe. But Jesus cast the demons out of the person and immediately he cared for the person, both physically and spiritually. He rid the person of the darkness that had consumed them. And this is what Jesus does for us. We may not have a demon possessing us, but as we discussed last week, we have a sinful nature that does consume us. 
And the only way we can have that dark, consuming, sinful nature removed is through Jesus healing our souls. It begins now on earth as we repent and are forgiven of our sins, and it is finished once we enter heaven and we are completely rid of that sinful nature. You know, people often talk metaphorically about the the demons in their life, you know, things they have done or they are doing, or even something that was done to them that continue to haunt them and keep them from living in true freedom. So if you have something like that in your life that is keeping you from living in unhindered freedom, come to Jesus and let Him metaphorically cast out that demon through His tender love, unhindered grace, and open arms. Become a child of God. You don't have to fear spiritual beings. You don't have to to see them in any kind of unhealthy way. You can just see them for what they are. Angels are ministers and messengers, warriors and worshipers just like we are. And demons are adversaries out to devour us, to, to tempt us. But if we have a healthy view of who they are, I think it can better prepare us for how we engage with them in a daily life. So, let's just practice good, godly wisdom by looking at Scripture before we look to anything else. Uh, let's uh, pray, and then we'll close. God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Uh, even though this was a very different and interesting topic in some ways, uh, God, we thank you that your, your, your word, the Bible, does speak to it, and it doesn't just leave us without answers. It actually answers a lot of things that we have questions about regarding the nature and activity of spiritual beings. So, uh, God, just help us through your word and through your spirit to understand um, what we discussed today. Help us know that it is good and right to believe in the supernatural, but it's, it's uh, good and right to not have an unhealthy fear or even an unhealthy obsession with them as well. Uh, so God, we do ask as we go through this life and we do face uh, spiritual warfare on a daily basis, whatever way it comes to us, God, we know that um, uh, Satan only wants to destroy us. He wants to devour us and he wants to tempt us and blind us and all these things, God. So we do ask for your protection. However you choose to do that, we do ask for your protection. Uh, and God, help us as we do fight these daily battles. Help us as we uh, do navigate life in this natural world that also has a supernatural component to it as well. Uh, so God, thank you for your word today. and Thank you for this time. And we ask this in your powerful and precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, um, as we wrap up today, just a few kind of closing announcements. Um, As we mentioned, uh, if you're new to Hope Church, we just encourage you to fill out that uh, Connect card there in the Worship Guide link. Just want to just get in touch with you and uh, connect with you more. Even even if you want to write on there in the little comment box on the Connect card, you know, you're crazy for believing that. That's okay. When COVID is done, we'll go have a coffee and we'll talk about it a little bit more. You probably even find out that I'm even more crazy than what you originally thought. But I still would love to chat with you and get to know you more. Uh, We all would. Uh, Parents, uh, the kids' resources are there available on our website. If you go to the uh, the kids link uh, on our website, you'll see the uh, access to the video for today that has the Bible lesson, the song, and the uh, the craft and everything. So get out your craft kits and all that is ready for you to do today whenever you would like. Um, and then uh, next uh, Sunday, uh, we will be uh, in person and on Zoom. And so we would uh, welcome you to join us at Hamptons Golf Club again next Sunday at 1030. Uh, if you are um, uh, willing to come in person, we have uh, all the COVID measures in place that our government requires. Uh, but if uh, you're not able to join us in person, we will still have the Zoom call next week as well. So let's read our closing verse and we'll be dismissed for the day. This comes from Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to thank you for joining us for worship today. 